Well, we heard a little bit uh, about uh, the FDIC in the last uh, panel conversation and turning to our regulators again, I am delighted, delighted to welcome Yelena McWilliams, the chairman of the FDIC, who will be here to offer uh, her insights as to the agency's central role uh, in this conversation. Thank you, as always, uh, so much uh, for, for, for joining us. No, thank you. The pleasure is truly mine, Chris. And it's been truly an, an enticing a conversation and something that the FDIC has been focusing on quite a bit. So it's an honor to be here. Well, you know, I guess we can just hop into it uh, from, from there. You know, we, we had uh, really started off the conference uh, talking to uh, the new acting comptroller and, 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 and a little bit about the perspective there as a banking regulator. But, but how do you see the FDIC's particular place? It's always useful to kind of start from a 10,000 foot um, perspective. Uh, given its mission uh, in terms of the governance and, and support of, of, of MDIs, uh, you know, where does the FDIC fit in? How do you view the agency's uh, role as, as being distinct from, from other uh, essential parts of the government? Well, let me tell you, no kidding. Uh, so <laughs> here's, here's how we look at this. At least here's how I started looking at this when I assumed this, uh, this important role. And I say important not because of me, but because of, of the, the possibilities that the chairman of the FDIC can bring to this issue. As you know, the FDIC is the nation's deposit insurer for our banks, as well as the primary supervisor for the majority of banks in the United States many of which happen to be community banks, and also the, the main uh, supervisor, I would say we have the most MDIs under our supervision. And one of the key things that I did when I, when I came to the FDIC on this particular issue, I basically asked staff, how, how are our MDIs doing? You know, how are Black banks doing? How are you know, Hispanic banks doing? How are Native American bank do, banks doing? And how are Asian American banks doing? And we generally split them in, into those categories. I know there are some others, uh, uh, banks that serve primarily immigrant communities, et cetera. But these are generally the categories we'll look at. And it became clear to me very early on that uh, depending on geographic distribution of these banks, depending on the, on the um, customer base that they bank, depending on the, the nature of the economic, socioeconomic conditions in their communities, some of them are doing better than others. But in any case, uh, the issue with uh, facing the African-American banks in particular has been that they get uh, small deposit amounts to the bank. And so when you get a small deposit amount from each individual depositor, and it costs you still the same, and in many cases, even more to service that account on a monthly basis, you're not uh, uh, approaching this from the economies of scale. And part of the reason is the you know, socioeconomic conditions in the primarily African-American community, but largely also in the Hispanic community. And so I ask, what can we do as the primary regulator of community banks? Because the same good old things that we've been doing about MDIs um, obviously has not uh, leveled the playing field. So that's, I would say, uh, that in addition to a statutory mandate that we have to preserve and promote minority deposit institutions, I took very seriously to heart and I wanted to understand what the issues are so that we don't do the same old thing, so that we basically break that mold and do something a little bit different. Because if the same old worked, these banks would be by far more advanced uh, in their standing in the kind of an ecosystem of the banking industry than they are today. So we did a number of things, and I'm happy to tell you what they are if I have an opportunity. No, no of course, please. No, no, I mean, it's, it's really interesting, you know, sort of breaking them apart. And, and we, were, we were talking about different kinds of of aspects of, of demographics and the different kinds of challenges, different kinds of communities face. And you're really continuing that conversation. And, and so this is really quite helpful. Um, how did you approach you know, that kind of variance and, 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 and sort of get the FDIC um, engaged? So what, what I did first and foremost was to do uh, extensive outreach to uh, min minority deposit institutions. And so I met with different groups uh, and I met with a number of African-American banks. And as you know, the number is not that high. It's, it hovers around 20. Um, and so I did meet with a number of, of African-American CEO, bank CEOs, and I basically said, tell me, tell me about you. Tell me, tell me about your bank. Tell me about your community. Tell me what I, as the FDIC chairman, need to know. And almost, um, I would say, almost ubiquitously, they told me, uh, the main thing we need is capital because, again, we're dealing with small deposit uh, uh, amounts in each of the accounts. Our base is what it is. Uh, our communities are struggling economically uh, for, for kind of a decades, if not a couple of centuries. And so in many cases where these banks have been around for, um, we, have, we have a couple of them that are um, 50 plus years old. 
the issue has been how do we kind of uh, address the systemic inequality that has existed for a long time through the banking channels. And capital was number one thing that they identified and also the notion of kind of a promoting the cause of these banks. Because unlike the majority of the banks in the United States, these are mission-driven banks. And their mission is not to necessarily, you know, make a buck. Uh, their mission is to help the communities that they serve because in many cases, but for their presence, these communities would not have a branch or another bank in their, in their, uh, on the ground in their communities. So uh, through those conversations, it became clear to me that we need to pay higher attention, more emphasis on these banks, but uh, not only to highlight the, the mission side of the mission-driven banking uh, with, with the MDIs, but also to make sure that uh, we put, you know, our, 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 our money where, where, where our mouth is. And so I was literally on a plane someplace over the United States uh, and I watched the Shark Tank. And by the time I landed, I said, I want a Shark Tank for, for minority depository institutions. And uh, as you can imagine, the lawyer said, the FDIC said, you want what? And I said, I want a Shark Tank. I want to create a fund. Uh, I don't know how we're going to create it. I don't know how we're going to fund it. But I want an opportunity for MDIs to come and make pitches to this fund. And then that's how they would get capital. And this fund would have to have uh, what I like to call a noble mission, meaning being more mission oriented than profits oriented, uh, but to be a serious fund. So as you can imagine, uh, our lawyers scratch their heads uh, and uh, the buzz around the FDIC is the chairman wants a mission driven uh, short tank fund. So it took, a, it took a little bit of nudging and et cetera, but we created a mission-driven bank fund, which is basically a fund that's created by the FDIC, but it's not going to be funded by the FDIC. Uh, we are going to put our name, our brand behind it. We're going to put our influence behind it. Uh, and then we're going to have private um, side, private company investors uh, investing in this fund. Uh, we're hoping to uh, make it big. Right, make it bigger, go home. Uh, and we have an initial investment uh, commitment of about $100 million from Microsoft. We're in talks with a couple of other institutions that are looking to invest. But I'm hoping that we can grow this, uh, this fund to um, more than just seven digits uh, and, and 10 digits, uh, and, and we'll see how far we can take it. We have also increased representation of minority depository institutions on our Community Bank Advisory Council. Right now, they represent about one-sixth of that council so that the other banks, the non-MDIs, can hear about the mission side of the MDIs and that there can be an exchange of, opi of opinions right. uh, and influences. So it's something that, that uh, we are really focused on as well. No, no, no. That, that, that's, that's really a very broad and, uh, um, uh, agenda. C can I just ask one quick question with, with the new fund that, that, that you're creating? I mean, one of the, the, the themes, if one will, that we've heard, uh, throughout the day from, from, uh, really, uh, a very wide uh, sort of variety of, of folks, including, uh, John Rogers, uh, is, is this idea that, uh, you know, what are you going to use the, the capital for? You know, is this a kind of, you know, when you think about the recapitalization effort, is this something to sort of bring these MDIs back to life? Or, or you know, is this also, are we thinking about resources to help them modernize, particularly since, you know, post-pandemic, you're now in a wholly digital economy. You know, it, it, are we thinking about how do we not only allow them to survive, but sort of compete, uh, yes. uh, and especially when you have um, some digitally enabled uh, competitors. I mean, how do you think about how you deploy those resources um, as you're putting together, you know, that particular uh, uh, tool? So we look at the fund as a holistic approach to uh, the MDIs. So capital will be available to them through the fund. Technical assistance will be available through the fund. We're also exploring um, other aspects where we can allow non-MDIs to team up with MDIs and kind of like the, the, the partnership uh, where some of the technological experience and the IT services could be provided to the MDIs by non-MDIs, by, by I like to call them their bigger brethren. Uh, and so we're exploring in, in different ways, not just through the fund, but also through other channels. Uh, we created speed dating. Uh, I like to say this is not your grandmother's FDIC. So we put speed dating events throughout the United States in our six regional offices, where we put in the same room non-MDIs, larger banks with smaller MDIs, and we literally had them go around the table. Uh, uh, this is the, the six minute dating uh, to see if there is an opportunity for a partnership. And we're also educating non-MDIs, regular banks. We're basically telling them, listen, you can get CRA credit 
for this involvement, if you provide technical assistance, IT support, whatever else, to, to, an, to a non to, a, to an MDI, you can actually qualify for CRA. And not only are you qualifying for CRA, but you're going to do so much good in the communities that the MDIs are specifically focused on. So the fund is focused on the capital investment. There's a technical aspect and a kind of a consultative aspect of the fund as well. Um, uh, but again, the fund will not be run by the FDIC. It'll have a professional fund manager. Uh, there will be anchor investors who are making some of these decisions. And uh, we will have an observer on the fund board but that's really um, uh, kind of a thinking outside of the box. How can an FDIC, a government agency, engage in kind of a funding and, and providing the, the support and landing our brand to the mission that the MDIs serve? Yeah, you know, that, that's 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 extremely helpful. And, and it's going to be interesting as well to just sort of see how that, for example, how that model uh, compares to or contrasts to the CDFI fund. I mean, it sounds like there's a little bit more functionality in terms of how you're you're thinking about being able to use those resources and obviously, you know, uh, um, seeking out some some private capital. You know, um, uh, and so Chris, if I can just, I should be more specific. So it's available to CDFI, the CDFIs that are banks as well. So it's insured depository institutions that are, that are MDIs and CDFIs. So we will have the the plethora of of and hopefully a good mix of CDFIs and MDIs eligible for the funds. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know, um, uh, you are and have been a, a speaker in, in the past at a number of, of our events, and, and, and I really want to continue this particular conversation in terms of, um, you know, thinking about the technology rails. We're about to, to, to switch over to our, to, to our last uh, speaker in finale, but I, I did want to thank you very, very much. Uh, you know, these conversations uh, require everybody from government picking, uh, pitching in, and, and, and you've always, uh, you know, uh, been very gracious with with your time, and I and I want to thank you. Well, thank you, Chris, and and I have to thank you to to resolve and and solve these long standing issues. We do have to think outside of the box, and so I'm excited to see that your last last speaker is somebody who thinks outside of the box, and I look forward to the next segment. Great, thank you so much. Thank you.